Uh, tonight, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kristen Mann to you. Dr. Mann earned her PhD from Northern Arizona University and has taught at UA Little Rock for 20 years now, working as a specialist in the history of colonial America, colonial Latin America, I should say, and the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. She's the author of a book, The Power of Song, Music and Dance in the Mission Communities of Northern New Spain, 1590 to 1810, and numerous articles, grants, projects, many of which were created with teaching in mind. In addition to research and teaching, Dr. Mann performs an enormous amount of service for work for the university and our local community. I must say, our faculty were generally hardworking folks, but you got to get up really early to do as much work as Dr. Mann does for the department and the university. I could recite a list of those things for you, but for now, I want to emphasize the following trait that Dr. Mann exhibits, courage. Teaching takes tremendous courage, as many of you know. In addition to the basic measure of courage required to teach, it takes additional courage to teach about controversial topics, as Dr. Mann regularly does. It takes additional courage to challenge colleagues and university officials to always do right by their students and coworkers. Dr. Mann does that too. It takes additional courage to invest one's time and energy into students without knowing the end result. Dr. Mann does that as much as anyone I know. Teaching is how many of you came to know Dr. Mann. She's the coordinator for the department's social studies education program, and in this role, she is largely responsible for training future teachers. She regularly visits schools throughout central Arkansas, observes student teachers, and facilitates numerous discussions about how to teach effectively. Thus, there's certainly no one better qualified to speak on teaching history in polarized times. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mann to the podium. That was a really nice introduction, thank you. Well, tonight I would like to place our current challenges of teaching in politically divided times within historical context to think about how teaching history today is similar to and different from other moments in our nation's history and other places in the world. In other words, as our colleague Fred Williams always liked to say, is teaching history in this moment typical or unique? So let's begin with the present. What challenges face history teachers today? Well, in addition to burnout, overwork, and stress, which have heightened over the past three years as we've lived through a pandemic, learned new technologies, and practiced techniques for teaching in new formats, as these headlines illustrate, increased scrutiny of curriculum, books on classroom shelves, the language we use, the assignments we create, and the 64 new state laws in this legislative session regulating teaching of things like divisive concepts, we've got a lot of anxiety. So we can look at news stories and speeches and proposed and enacted legislation past and present, and we can examine it the same way that we would examine any primary source. Who wrote this document? For whom? Why? What's the historical context of this moment in time? And when we do this, we find that we've been in this place before, trying to navigate teaching history in politically polarized times. But what's different today is the almost continuous fundraising and campaigning cycle and its connection to extraordinary spending on politics and the explosion of social media in all its various forms that can make it difficult to tell a consistent story. So let's examine tonight three interrelated topics. The place of history in our curriculum, the ways in which political and cultural concerns have resulted in policies affecting the teaching of history, and then the repercussions on teachers. <laughs> 
Then I'll turn to lessons that we might learn from the past to apply to our current moment. Why teach history anyway? And who decides what to teach? Well, in our federal system, since education is not specifically mentioned in the Constitution, it's left to the states to provide guidance on curriculum, the content and skills that students learn. This differs from many other countries around the world in which the national government directs the learning goals and publishes the school textbooks. Although education was important for promoting civic virtue from the nation's founding, history didn't become a part of required school curriculum in many places until midway through the 20th century. Generally, the amount of time that US students spend learning history has increased from the advent of public schooling in the 19th century and throughout the 20th century. Over time, reformers like John Dewey promoted American history instruction because it cultivated a shared national identity, patriotism, thrift, and hard work. By the 1980s, students graduating from high schools around the country had, on average, three required social studies courses, uh, something that Arkansas didn't feel was necessary in 1921. Uh, it was a regular subject of K-8 education. In the 1990s, experts led by U.S. historian Gary Nash, UCLA education professor Charlotte Crabtree, and world historian Ross Dunn collaborated on voluntary national standards for kindergarten through 12th grade U.S. and world history. Congress held hearings on the standards. They were the focus of media attention, producing a firestorm of controversy for their focus on multiculturalism over traditional political history. And you might remember Newt Gingrich and Lynn Cheney, and there were lots of, uh, lots of ink spilled in newspapers, too. The standards were ultimately not endorsed by Congress, but they still proved influential to the development of curriculum and textbooks. Senators Richard Byrd and Lamar Alexander countered this presentation of more multicultural inclusive history standards with a grant program to fund programs promoting, quote, traditional American history late in the decade. And we in Little Rock were a recipient of three of those grants, and they were used in various different ways by people all over the country for professional development and curriculum development. The 2001 No Child Left Behind legislation inadvertently impacted the place of history in the curriculum, with its focus on reporting standardized testing scores in reading, writing, and math, which were tied to federal funding, Time devoted to history and social studies has dramatically decreased since 2001. Studies in the last two decades have pointed to the marginalization of social studies instructional time in kindergarten through eighth grade schools, an average of less than two and a half hours a week, particularly when compared to instruction in literacy, which is close to 12 hours a week. The decrease in social studies instruction is cause for concern. Economics, civics, U.S. and world history remain required subjects for high school graduation in most states, including Arkansas, but students often have almost no background knowledge before they get to those high school courses. And just as an example, Little Rock School District right now uh, teaches all of its uh, social studies in kindergarten through fifth grade through Wit and Wisdom, which is a uh, basal text for reading. So there's no, any text that's in there was not written by historians. It was written by reading specialists at specific lexile levels. And in addition, they get to get little handouts called Studies Weekly that are kind of like brief events of current events that teachers can optionally use or not. But that's it for social studies instruction right now. We need to be putting pressure on the board to bring social studies back into elementary. Lots of studies show us that instructing students in rich content in science and social studies improves their reading and writing scores because they're reading and writing about interesting things. So um, we should be sharing that widely. If the place of history and social studies in our school's curriculum has declined in the last two decades after consistent increases through the 20th century, how does this trend relate to disagreements about what we teach? A look back from the late 19th century to the present reveals that no matter its relative importance in the school curriculum, 
History wars flare up every few decades as part of moral panics and perceived threats from those within or outside our society. Just as there is much current conversation about the rights of parents and local boards to oversee books and instructional materials used in schools, many of the history wars of the past surrounded textbooks. In the early 19th century, Southerners decried Yankees who spread abolitionist ideals and published their own incendiary school books. After the Civil War and into the first decades of the 20th century, textbook narratives about US history offered competing interpretations of the founders, the nature of plantation slavery, the causes of the Civil War, the process and impact of Reconstruction. Historian of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Mildred Rutherford, wrote a measuring rod to test textbooks and reference books in schools, colleges, and libraries in 1919 to offer guidance to local communities about instructional materials that were appropriate for children. In speaking engagements, she warned that generations of Southern children would be ashamed rather than proud of their heritage if biased classroom materials were not rejected. And you can read that same headline at school boards uh, and in letters that principals get from concerned parents today. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but the, the headings here are really interesting, right? The Constitution of the United States, 1787, was a compact between sovereign states and was not perpetual nor national. Um, secession was not rebellion. The North was responsible for the war between the states. The war between the states was not fought to hold the slaves. The slaves were not ill-treated in the South, and the North was largely responsible for their presence in the South. Coercion was not constitutional. Um, and it goes on, right? And the, she has a whole foreword here about why this is necessary. And then the rest of the uh, measuring rod basically says this is a list of topics that need to be covered and these are the appropriate quotations that should be taken from these documents and she very much cherry picks the types of uh, quotations that suit her narrative. Rutherford wrote during a period of fierce public debate in which teachers and texts were scrutinized by those opposed to all sorts of things, internationalism, evolution, and socialism, as well as those who argued for the inclusion of the stories of workers, immigrants, and women. And of course, the Ku Klux Klan was on the rise at that moment as well. If we analyze sources from this time, we see the contours of the decades politics and economics. American isolationism after the First World War, the failure to join the League of Nations, increased immigration from Southern and Central Europe and Mexico, the impact of ideas like socialism and communism, which promoted workers' rights. In 1925, the American Legion wrote and promoted a new history textbook, The Story of Our American People, because it was not happy with David Muzzy's popular 1917 textbook. And they said in their promotional materials that the blunders, foibles, and frailties of prominent heroes and patriots should be left out of history education. That was a subject only appropriate for college. Legislation from this decade sought to control the information shared by teachers in classrooms and disseminated in textbooks. A 1923 Wisconsin law required that, quote, no history or other textbook shall be adopted for use, which falsifies the facts regarding the War of Independence or the War of 1812, or which defames our nation's founders or misrepresents the ideals and cause for which they struggled and sacrificed, or which contains propaganda favorable to any government. Tennessee's Butler Act and similar legislation in other states, including Arkansas, prevented teachers from discussing any theory, quote, which denies the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible. And of course, this was challenged famously in the Scopes trial. Similar to the religious backlash over the inclusion of Darwin's theory of evolution in science texts, new and important historical avenues of inquiry have repeatedly triggered controversy. For example, Arthur Schlesinger's 1922 book, New Viewpoints in American History, which included chapters on women and immigrants, was the subject of a public book burning by Chicago Mayor Bill Thompson in 1927 on the steps of City Hall. <laughs> 
the 1928 newspaper on this slide talks about that. Um, he was actively seeking out more appropriate, it's the 100% history there, 100% Americanism was really popular then. Um, he was actively seeking out more patriotic textbooks for the students of Chicago. Harold Rugg, professor at Columbia Teachers College, came under fire for his textbooks and pedagogy in the 1940s. It's this article up here. Rugg advocated teaching the social sciences through an examination of current problems and issues, inquiry and practice with mock trials, debates, and deliberations, leading to campaigns to ban his books from school and libraries and a public uh, book burning in Ohio. Textbook wars occurred in the post-war period in the new nation of Israel over explanations of the nation's settlement, founding, and conflicts with Palestinians, and also in Japan over descriptions of events during World War II. So this is something that we see in other places and other times. In the United States, history textbooks of the 1950s and 1960s embraced a more controversy-free consensus history which glossed over race, slavery, and harsh conditions for workers. Francis Fitzgerald calls the textbooks of this period boosterish. Meanwhile, in the United States, McCarthyism and fears of communism, as well as battles over integrating public schools, led states to new policies to prevent, quote, indoctrination. Some required teachers to sign broad loyalty oaths, including the 1955 Teacher Affidavit Act in Arkansas, or to disclose all memberships and affiliations, such as Arkansas Act 10 of 1958. Not until, until the more recent past, after the end of the Cold War, have curriculum standards and teaching materials consistently included greater detail about topics once omitted. The transatlantic slave trade, the slaveholding of prominent American leaders, the lives and contributions of women, people of color, and workers, restrictions on civil liberties during wartime. But a look at current textbooks developed for the growing homeschool market, which our taxpayers' money will soon be paying for, shows that these books still provide very problematic narratives about those topics or fail to include them altogether. Today, we find ourselves in another conversation about what American students should learn about the past. We find echoes of the 1920s, the Cold War, and the 1990s national standards debate in our newspapers, our television, and social media. The broadening of the scope of historical research to include those marginalized or left out of past narratives, the diversification of our history profession, and the widespread impact of conversations around things like the 1619 Project, which centers African Americans in the narrative of US history, all these have triggered a new wave of history wars resulting in current legislation. So how have teachers been impacted by political polarization and moral panics? There are numerous examples of repercussions on those who teach history in polarized times, from blacklisting to disciplinary actions and terminations. Like I mentioned earlier, laws requiring loyalty oaths were passed in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution and the Soviet sweep across Eastern Europe after World War II, leading to teacher firings. Not surprisingly, Joseph McCarthy's crusade caused blowbacks in education. Teachers at New York City's public colleges, including Dr. Vera Schlagman, who wrote an important 1935 book on female factory workers, were pushed out by the Board of Higher Education. In 1951, American Legion magazine published a blacklist of universities employing subversive and communist faculty members. These repercussions didn't end once McCarthyism passed. The California Board of Regents fired Angela Davis in 1969 for her Communist Party membership. And members of the Arkansas legislature called for the non-reappointment of UA Little Rock Assistant Professor of History Grant Cooper after he openly announced that he was a communist in 1973. Cooper was terminated in a letter that cited poor classroom performance and a lack of publications, and he went to court arguing that the university had no systematic measures for reviewing faculty teaching and research. <clears throat> 
Although the lawsuit wasn't resolved until 1980, he didn't teach at UALR again. In the past several years, teachers have been fired or placed on administrative leave for expressing both conservative and liberal political views. Timothy Crutchfield of California and Kenneth Lewis of Virginia faced termination in 2018 and 2021, respectively, for their statements critical of President Donald Trump. James Troyer of Ohio and Melissa Thompson of Georgia in 2019 and 2020 were fired for disrupting learning environments for their disparaging remarks about Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ students. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin and the Texas Education Agency established tip lines and web forms for students and concerned citizens to report schools that are teaching critical race theory. And Turning Points USA created a professor watch list. Some of our colleagues are on that list. <laughs> Teachers across the country have faced consequences ranging from forced changes to their lesson plans to reprimands and suspensions while official investigations take place. And all of this, of course, disrupts the learning environment. A look elsewhere in the world shows similar trends. Beijing law professor and critic of President Xi Jinping spent a week in detention before being fired by his university, while Hungary's President Viktor Orban recently nationalized control over school and imposed new restrictive curriculum, textbooks, and policies for teachers. Or we might look further back in the past to 1942 when approximately 1,000 Norwegian teachers were arrested by the German Nazi government and nearly half sent to concentration camps for more than six months after they refused to join the Nazi Teachers Association and adopt the newly imposed curriculum. But teachers such as those in Norway have also fought back both publicly and privately by continuing to hold classes in private, through demonstrations and the courts, and with varying degrees of success. For example, in the past six months in Hungary, teachers, parents, and students have engaged in strikes and walkouts to protest Orban's new mandated curriculum, which emphasizes rote memorization and new state-published textbooks. Over 40,000 teachers, more than a third of the teaching force in the country, walked out in nationwide strikes. They were joined by another 40,000 parents, students, and additional teachers in the fall, basically shutting down the city of Budapest. To date, the restrictive education measures are still in place, but the protests have continued. And meanwhile, the Orban administration has tried to undermine public sympathy for teachers by saying that they're going to offer higher salaries. Teachers have also challenged restrictive legislation and censorship in court. Cramp versus Board of Public Instruction of Orange County, Florida, established that broad loyalty oaths, including disavowing communism, violated teachers' First Amendment rights. But a later decision from New York allowed states and districts to require teachers to pledge loyalty to the U.S. and state constitutions. In 1960, local teacher and NAACP member Ben Shelton challenged Arkansas Act 10 requiring disclosure of all professional memberships. They were hunting for NAACP members um, in the wake of the Central High Crisis. Um, that was not as successful. Uh, it was later, though, went on to the Supreme Court, um, coupled with a couple of other cases, and got tossed out on the 14th Amendment, not a First Amendment claim. In 1968, Little Rock Central High biology teacher Susan Epperson challenged our state's 1928 law that prohibited teachers from teaching or using materials that taught human evolution. Although she won her case in Chancery Court, it was reversed by the state Supreme Court and then appealed to the, the U.S. Supreme Court. In his majority opinion, Justice Fortas wrote that although the state had the right to dictate curriculum, this did not prohibit the teaching of a scientific theory or doctrine where that prohibition is based on reasons that violate the First Amendment, including prohibition of material objectionable to a particular religious group or dogma. So I think that's applicable today. However, more recent court decisions in Connick versus Myers, 1983, and Garcetti versus Ceballos, 2006, have established that public employees, including teachers, have limited free speech rights when carrying out official responsibilities if that speech undermines the public institution's mission. 
So what, what might we learn from these other places and times? We might recognize the current focus on wokeness as a moral panic created by fears of a loss of power or a loss of a traditional narrative of a shared national past, an echo of an earlier media outcry against Yankees or communists. Social scientists who study moral panics, widespread fears that something or someone threatens the values or well-being of a community, especially its children, show that moral panics result in the targeting and marginalization of others, including immigrants, youth, individuals with poverty, the most vulnerable in society. Moral panics lead to the spread of misinformation, sometimes intentionally by elites who wish to hold on to power, and they lead to fear. And self-censorship is perhaps the largest danger that results from these very public battles over history and culture. The current spate of laws contains vague language, banning things like discussions which cause students to feel guilty. This has a chilling effect because it isn't exactly clear what's prohibited by law. And it causes teachers and especially administrators to encourage teachers to shy away from teaching anything that might cause them to be reprimanded or fired or show up in the newspaper or be called in front of the school board. Self-censorship, too, has a history. A 1941 survey of teachers found that they shied away from teaching anything they perceived as controversial. One respondent termed subjects like slavery political dynamite. Diane Ravitch's 2003 book, The Language Police, found widespread self-censorship among educational publishers who instituted strict internal guidelines for topics language and images in the multi-billion dollar textbook and test publishing industry. To combat fear, misinformation, and self-censorship, we need to raise awareness about the policies that guide social studies education. K-12 and higher education teachers need to work together to support each other and inform the public in venues like this how we teach history, as well as reading, writing, and analysis using our state curriculum frameworks. Involved citizens need to run for local school boards, show up to meetings and hearings, and help their neighbors stay informed. Advocacy, advocacy groups are also important. The NAACP and the ACLU both worked to counter McCarthyism, for example. Having an organization and funding can help provide legal representation for those who challenge vague policies and disciplinary actions in court. Coalition building is also wise and often effective. Employers need graduates who can read and write and think. Conventions, tourists, and talented prospective employees might bypass our state in favor of other places. History shows us that economic strategies such as boycotts, although they don't often produce quick results, are often very effective over the span of years instead of weeks or months. And, of course, college athletes and coaches in a state that generally agrees about one major thing, support of the Razorbacks, have powerful voices as well. How should we approach teaching history in this moment in time? Well, I advise our pre-service teachers to lean into our state curriculum frameworks, which, like other state standards, tell us to have students read and analyze primary sources, to understand the spread and impact of systems of belief around the world, to investigate the causes and effects of events like the Civil War, the Elaine Massacre, and Japanese American incarceration during World War II. Our governor's recent executive order states, quote, nothing shall be construed to prohibit the discussion of ideas and history of the concepts, or shall be construed to prohibit the discussion of public policy issues of the day and related ideas that individuals may find unwelcome, disagreeable, or offensive. Talking points on the Arkansas Learns legislation emphasize teaching children how to think, not what to think. Well, we can all agree on this. It's precisely what we do as social studies educators. We must not avoid teaching current events or hard history. These are what help prepare students for active citizenship and careers in an interconnected world. Instead, we need to use artifacts and texts from our past and present and model the types of questions that historians ask. Who created this? Why? 
for what audience, in what context. Then we invite students to pose questions of their own and support those claims with evidence, all skills that prepare them for careers in citizenship. A few notes of caution are important. First, we must avoid the tendency to portray events and issues as having two sides and people as either allies or opponents. A recent law in Texas states that K-12 teachers cannot be compelled to teach current events, and if they do, they, most, they must, quote, give deference to both sides. However, examinations of primary and secondary sources show us that perspectives on the past and present issues are individual and plentiful, and issues have many sides, not both sides. It's also tempting to excuse those in the past, particularly the starring characters in our nation's traditional narrative, as products of their time, or to tell the stories without pointing out the inconsistencies between their words and their actions. Writing against the backdrop of the history wars of the 1920s, Pulitzer Prize winning historian James Truslow Adams noted that historians and history teachers don't have enough time in the curriculum or space in textbooks to examine the past in all its nuance. But if we only teach the heroic actions of Washington and Jefferson and omit their slaveholding, heeding the call to speak no evil of the dead, quote, do we not rob those other dead who fought against those evils a portion of their just share of renown? Last, we must also avoid false equivalencies and relativism. History has facts. The Holocaust happened. And while historians offer differing interpretations about the causes and the consequences, they do not deny that it occurred. Vague language and legislation might lead us to be afraid to correct false history or to give equal weight to interpretations supported by large amounts of information versus those that are fringe interpretations with scant evidence. After all, Kentucky teachers violate the current law if they use instructional materials that are, quote, not respectful to the differing perspectives of students. But we must stand firm Settled facts are not the same as differing perspectives. The election of 2020 was not stolen, so we must be vigilant against disinformation cloaked in the language of presenting both sides or honoring different viewpoints. Ultimately, though, we should not lose hope or our purpose to educate citizens in our democratic nation. History wars can have some advantages. Media attention about the way we teach and write about the past makes the public curious. Banning a book or the teaching of a particular topic is a surefire way to make a teenager eager to investigate it. We must also keep our sights on the long term. The Scopes trial and efforts to limit the teaching of Darwin's theory of evolution in schools resulted in the long term in a shift towards teaching science through inquiry and evidence instead of rote memorization. Attempts to limit history education to narratives of exceptionalism have sometimes produced short-term policy and self-censorship, but history curriculum, texts, and online primary sources today tell a broader story of our national past than did those of the past. I'd like to conclude by noting, as Nash, Crabtree, and Dunn did, that contention over the past is as old as written history itself. Continuously re-examining the past rather than piously repeating traditional narratives is the greatest service historians can render in a democracy. If you love your country, you love it in all its messiness. I know that my colleagues in K-12 and higher education will continue to encourage our students to examine the past in all its complexity. And now I invite your comments and questions, and I know we have some history teachers here tonight who can probably provide much better perspective on what's happening in middle and high school classrooms than I can. I am a teacher, a high school teacher, um, with some of my colleagues, I'm going to out them. 
Um, but I was wondering for the pre-service teachers, how are they able to navigate a scared teacher in these difficult times of, well, my, my dad says that this teacher is too woke and you are, you know, indoctrinating me with your uh, left-wing agenda. Like, how, how are they able to, or how do you guide them into navigating, kind of being the middleman on that? Yeah, it, it's really tough. Can I comment on that? Sure, go ahead. So I'm a high school teacher. I actually have that situation in my classroom a lot. Yeah. Um, I work in a very conservative school with some very conservative students, and their parents actually also work in my school. Um, and how I do that is I tell them, I am not here to debate what your parents tell you. I am here to teach fact and standards set by the state. And that's what we're discussing in my classroom. If you can bring me fact based with research, we'll discuss what your parents tell you. But I'm not here to talk about what they're telling you. I'm here to talk about what we're learning today, which is based on fact and research and what the state tells us we have to learn. And I just cut it off. Like, we're not here to talk about what mom and dad said at home. We're here to talk about what's supposed to be happening in this room. Yeah, that's a good, good approach, right? She went through our social studies ed program. <laughs> proud, proud alum. We, I, I think, you know, teach, especially new teachers and the student teachers who get caught in the middle of some of this are really nervous because they don't yet have jobs, right? And they, they, they really want to impress administrators and anyone who might be on the school board. Um, but we have to have frank conversations too about knowing where you want to teach. And, um, you know, it's as a new teacher, there are some districts that I would not currently recommend for them to uh, look for a job in right now because of uh, local politics. And I think it's just easier for a, a um, more experienced teacher to, to navigate some of that. On the other hand, I mean, Susan Epperson was 26 when she challenged the, the um, law here in Arkansas. So sometimes we do need fearless young people to, to um, wade into those waters and um, you know, not be afraid to do what Doa was just saying and say, look, I'm, I'm teaching what's in my curriculum here and um, you can label it what you want, but that's, I'm just doing my job. Um, so, it's, it's a tough time though. They're really, the, what I see happening the most is that self-censorship. They're just not wanting to cover topics. Or if they cover topics, they're just in such a vague and general way. Or just like, here, read this in the textbook. Or I have a student teacher right now in Sheridan who's a cooperating teacher is teaching the AP psychology class. And it has whole units on you know, gender identity and uh, implicit bias. And, um, you know, so it's just like, well, directives from the district right now sort of say that we shouldn't cover this right now because we might violate the governor's executive order, uh, but the books are right over there on the shelf, right? And, you know, she's like 25 kids scramble over the books that can't open oh, that, the, yeah, that chapter while they're there, right? Um, so, but, it, you know, it's in the AP curriculum too, so it's, we've got these dueling standards as well. Yes. Sarah Sanders has said that she is dedicated to improving and helping the educational system. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Well, I, d I have to say I agree with the governor about some things, right? And I think it's really important to, to start there, like uh, with what, what we agree on, right? Teachers should be paid more. Experienced teachers should definitely p be paid more too. We definitely need literacy programs in um, early childhood to make sure that students are reading um, by the time they leave third grade. That's crucially important. Right, so um, you know those things, if done, will improve education in our state. Absolutely, I think where we uh, differ greatly is on um, you, like who has the solution for education problems. And I think teachers know best. They know their students. They know what um, what things will help them. We know that uh, the best performance and indicator of a student's test scores 
is the um, income of their family and the, the square footage of their primary dwelling space. Those are the two highly correlated factors with test scores. And until we can change some of those things, um, I don't think we're going to see drastic improvements in, in education. Um, so so I, I would turn the focus away from this, the, the buzzwords and the culture wars and the moral panics and, and see where we have common ground and let's start working on those things. So what are your thoughts about free choice in schools? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think that every parent should choose the best education for their child. I don't think that state dollars should be going to schools that aren't held to the same standards as other schools, and especially to support materials um, like, you know, these homeschool curriculum textbooks, Abeka books. If you've, there's a new book out, Hijacking History, that reviews the curriculum in those homeschool history textbooks, and it is... I mean, it'll make your head spin. It's uh, it's worse than the the slide that I showed you on 19 the 1919 um, measuring stick. Um, and so, yeah, that's really problematic. That that state funds would be going to schools that don't have to uh, provide the same um, opportunities for all students, and they're not held to the same standards. And what I find really problematic about the funding issue is just that. We, we know that when a, a child moves from school to school, they lose about an average, it's about 11 months of learning. Um, and, and what happens when you have that much open choice is that, that kids do move around a lot. And it takes a while to catch back up if, after you've lost that learning from being in the same environment. Um, and you know, so, so parents might try out a, a private school or a charter school or even homeschooling for six months and then they, they'll move the kid back because it's not working out, maybe mutually not working out. But then the, the uh, private school keeps that money that they got for the child for that year and the, the kid goes back to the public school where they now need additional resources because they're behind. And, um, you know, the public school has to serve everybody. So I think the, the math is, is, is not fair, and I'm, you know, fairness is something that really is deep, a, a deep value for me. So I'm not opposed to the idea of choice if everybody plays by the same rules, but that's the problem here is that, that everybody doesn't play by the same rules. All of these things are typical, the battles about what history is important and what we should teach. But this, the uniqueness of this moment, the way in which misinformation, um, misinformation has always spread, you know, it's, in, it, but it was pamphlets and broadsides and, you know, on the radio or on the, on the television or in a, a newspaper that had a very limited subscription and you might be able to find somewhere. But, um, you know, social media has really changed the, the game completely, the landscape and um, the fact that that our young people are on their devices on social media so much um, is is going to be a problem for this next generation if we don't get better about uh, limiting that and teaching them how to critically consume information. And again, you know, if all we're doing in our um, literacy classes is prepping for the test, they're not getting any instruction in how to do research and how to detect misinformation. Sam Weinberg at Stanford has a really good project right now. It's a research-based project called a Civics Online Reasoning Curriculum. And he's got a lot of modules that um, I've used. I think your communications class actually could be really helpful to you about um, you know, detecting misinformation, evaluating sources. All right, thank you all. Go out and change the world. You too can share in the excitement of historical discovery through the Evenings with History series. For more information, contact the University History Institute at ualr.edu history.